Does any, anybody else besides me hate to wait? Like, like it can drive me crazy to wait for something and feel like, you know, I just, I just don't know how long this is going to go on. Like just now, just so you know, that was 30 seconds. I timed it carefully. And uh, I don't know about for you. For me, it felt like an eternity. Uh, it was awkward. And I would bet that it was even more awkward for you because I knew when it was going to end and you didn't. And one of the most annoying realities of life is waiting. Like you get stuck in a traffic jam and you feel like, you know, it's just never going to untangle. Or you, you have to call somebody to deal with, with something, a company, you know, like uh, just a company, cable company or the doctor or whatever. And somebody picks up and they say, hey, do you mind if I put you on hold? And you know it's rhetorical because you can't just say, yeah, actually, I totally mind. Like, you're going on hold no matter what. And if it's an insurance company or if it's the cable company or something like that, you know you could be on hold for like 15, 20 minutes or more. So you're, you're sitting there stuck, and the worst part is you have no idea when it's going to end. Like, have you ever listened to a sermon and it just goes on and on? And you start to think, this is, this is never going to end. If you haven't, just wait. And one of the reasons we don't like waiting is that it reminds me that I'm not in control. Okay, when I'm waiting, I can't do any of the important things that make me feel like I'm accomplishing something. So like when you go to the doctor's office, they have a whole room devoted to waiting. It's called the, the waiting room. And the, the thing is, no one really volunteers to go to the waiting room. You just sort of get stuck there. And who is the one person in a doctor's office that you will never see in the waiting room? The doctor. Like the doctor is way too important for the waiting room. Okay, you'll, you'll never have a receptionist say to you on the way in, hey, how about this? You go sit in the doctor's office. Like you make the calls that you need to make and you get done whatever, whatever it is you need to get done. You accomplish whatever it is you need to accomplish and the doctor will wait for you in the waiting room. And then whenever you're ready, you just let us know. Whenever you're ready, we'll send the doctor in. That, that'll never happen. Because one of the unspoken rules of waiting is the less important person always is waiting for the more important person. So, so waiting makes us feel like we're not very important. It makes us feel a little bit helpless because we don't know how long we're going to have to wait. Now, there are a few places that I found that do actually do a pretty good job of this, and companies are starting to think about this more and more, which is cool. But have you, have you ever called somewhere and been put on hold, and they have this little prompter that gives you updates? You know, like, there are seven more callers ahead of you, okay? Or there are four more callers in front of you. And I love that. I absolutely love that because I feel like I can sort of track my progress. Like I'm accomplishing something as I'm sitting on the phone. I can, I can just count it down. Look at all the callers that are peeling off as I just sit here doing nothing. This is amazing. And a lot of theme parks are starting to, to kind of catch on to this. Um, they have little signs in the lines, a lot of different places you go. And they'll say, that, you know, from here, okay, from this point, it will be approximately one hour. You know, or from this point, it'll be 45 minutes, or from this point, it'll be a half an hour. Jen and I spent our, uh, our honeymoon in Southern California, and uh, we, you know, we, we went down there because we like warmth, and we just wanted to chill on the beaches, but some people in Jen's church heard that we were going down there, and so they decided we, we would obviously want to go to Disneyland, so they arranged for us to get into Disneyland for free. Now, for me, on a honeymoon, when we're in our early 20s, Disneyland wasn't exactly my dream destination. You know, so for me, it's like, okay, there's Mickey Mouse, and there's Donald Duck, and there's all of this, you know. I mean, it's like, okay, maybe someday when we're, you know, when we're not in our early 20s and, and we have kids, that would be, be awesome. But, but right now on our honeymoon, I'm, I'm looking for a different vibe. <laughs> and so it's really not my thing, like, at all. But it was free, and they were going to ask us, did you go? And so we're like, ah, okay, we'll go to Disneyland. One day, we'll go. And it, it happened to be like 95 degrees. And it was insanely crowded. 
and the lines were so long. And I, I don't know about you, I hate being hot. <laughs> and I hate waiting. And so just when I like thought it couldn't get any worse, we'd already been there for a few hours, just line after line. And we're waiting in line for a ride that was about an hour long. And about 10 feet behind us in the line came this choir. It was like a, a, a youth choir from a Mormon church. And there were maybe eight or 12 of them. And I think there were probably like 60, you know, more of them somewhere. But we had like eight or 12 behind us. And they were so loud. And they were so obnoxious. And the whole personal space thing had escaped them. And they just like, oh, sorry, excuse me. And it was, you know, and then, okay, they decided to sing. So, so for almost an hour, because it was at Disneyland, they sang, It's a Small World, <laughs> over and over and over. And, and okay, now, it's a Mormon choir. They were good, uh, but it wasn't really a good thing. And so for the first five minutes, people were like, you know, they were like, okay, well, and they smiled at them politely and everything. And then for the next 10 minutes, people were like, oh, they're just going to keep going. So the next 10 minutes, people were kind of looking away and trying to give them the vibe like we're not into this. And they did their best to ignore them. And after about 15 minutes or so, with everybody hot and sweaty and stuck in the line, like it's a small world over and over and over, it was not working. And people started lashing out. Like people in front of us literally would just, every once in a while, you'd have someone go, they'd just be sitting there all of a sudden, they'd just go, shut up! <laughs> Which, of course, offended these poor children. So they started singing louder. And then they decided to suck. And they decided to, like, sing off-key. And it was... It was so, you should have seen, the people, it was like a mob. The people at the front of the line who endured this for 40 minutes. It, I, and I hate conflict. I just like, I wanted to go somewhere else and just like suck my thumb. I was like, ah. <laughs> so I'm at Disney, I'm losing my mind. And I was thinking to myself, Disneyland is supposed to be the happiest place on earth. And this is like hell on earth. On my honeymoon. And the only thing that enabled me to keep my sanity that like kept me from murdering some young Mormon students <laughs> were the signs along the way. Only 30 minutes from here. Oh, thank God. <laughs> Only 15 minutes from here. Oh. And so I was able to just sort of look at that and go into an, like an internal, just like a little seance and go, oh, I'll just try to block it all out. And 15 minutes, I can, I can hang in there. That's all I got to do, 15 more minutes. So I was thinking this week about waiting. And I was thinking, wouldn't it be cool if they had signs like that, like in real life? Like from this point on, six months till you find a spouse. Hey, I can do that. You know, from this point on, four years till your kids actually grow up. You know, from here, 10 years till your, your spouse grows up. Because we, we long, see, we long for now, and, and so often we live in this world of not yet. And it's not just that we don't know for sure when now is going to come. It's that if we're, if we're really honest, in most situations, we know that now may never come. And it's possible that our not yet could eventually become not ever. There's the waiting of a single person that wants to not be single anymore. And nothing's happening, nothing's, nothing's working out. There's the waiting of a childless couple. God, will you, will you please let us start our family? And they think it would be, it would be such a good thing. And we want it, we want it so bad. And it, God, this would be such a good thing. You, you would be in favor of this. But it just doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. There's the waiting of somebody who wants to find a good job. You know, a good job that can take care of the bills, but also a place to, to go every day to do something meaningful, something they've been trained to do. And the resumes go out, and the resumes go out, and the resumes go out, and nothing materializes. There's a waiting of a spouse that's trapped in a painful marriage, just feeling like it's never going to change. There's a waiting of a parent who's, who's now teenage or adult child is kind of off the rails, 
You know, will they come back? When will they come back? Will they ever come back? And see, when you have, when you have to wait for something big, and, and, and everybody here has, or if you haven't, you will, you tend to ask God a question. And this question comes up over and over and over in the Bible. In Psalm 13, okay, just one example, it gets, it gets expressed like this. How long, Lord, how long? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? And we're desperate to know. We want to know, God, how long? Like, how long before my not yet turns into a now? How long? And over and over again in the Bible, people ask this question and they cry out to God with this question and God hardly ever answers it. God hardly ever says, you know, another three days. You know, a week from Wednesday. What God generally says is just wait. And there's a lot of mystery to this kind of waiting. There's a lot that I I don't understand about waiting on God. But there is in the Bible a kind of perspective about waiting, a kind of pattern, a way of understanding it, that when you when you get it, it can change how you approach waiting. Now, because the Christmas season is, is here, I thought we'd, we'd look at a story in the Bible about some people that have been waiting for a, a long, long time. And this is, this is a Christmas story. This is in Gos- the Gospel of Luke. Luke tells us that after Jesus was born, Mary and Joseph took him to the temple, okay, which is what their law, which is what the Torah required. And Luke tells us this. He says, now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting. So Simeon was was waiting. And Luke is about to tell us what Simeon's waiting for, but I just want to pause here uh, to think about this statement, to ask you to, to think about this for you. Like, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? And as you think about that, I want to kind of challenge you I want to challenge what I think is kind of common thinking for a lot of of believers, a lot of Christ followers. A lot of times people think that waiting on the Lord means if I wait for God to give me what I want, God has to do it. So if I don't get the circumstances that that I want right now, but I keep, but I'm faithful, and I keep waiting on God, then God has to give me like even better circumstances in the future. For instance, maybe a guy has, you know, gets dumped by a girl and says, well, she was, you know, she was beautiful and she kind of seemed like my soulmate, but, you know, it didn't work out. And so obviously, okay, obviously God has someone better for me. Or maybe a woman applies for a job she really wants and she doesn't get it. And so she says to herself, wow, God must have an even better job for me. Or a couple puts down an offer on a house, and in their mind, it's like, and this happens, it's like they've already moved in. They're envisioning furniture and where it's all going to go. They're, they can see the kids that they don't even have yet playing in the yard. They know what colors they want to paint all of the walls. In their minds, they've already moved in. But then it turns out that the seller actually received another offer, a higher offer, and they sold the house to someone else. So after all of the initial disappointment, this couple takes takes some solace in the idea, hey, there must be an even better house out there for us. Now look, that kind of stuff does happen. God does that kind of stuff all the time. I mean, you think about this. A lot of you that are married, a lot of you, you went through some sort of painful breakup with someone else at some other point. Okay, but when you compare your, like that person to your spouse now, you think, dang it, you know, like, why did I blow that? No, you don't. (laughs) not at all. You, you think, oh man, okay, you think I'm so glad that didn't work out because my spouse is such a, an enormous upgrade over that person. That's what you think. You know, the breakup was painful, 
But there was someone better. And that, that stuff happens. It happens with jobs. It happens with spouses. It happens with houses and all kinds of stuff. But, but the person who always thinks, okay, if I don't get what I want right now, it's only because God will give me something even better in the future. So God is obligated to making sure I get exactly what I want. That person is, is swimming around in dangerous water. That's a dangerous place. Because if all of your hope is tied up in some particular circumstance, and you absolutely have to have it to really live, the obvious question is, what happens if you don't get it? Do you just quit living? Do you just put life on hold? I mean, do you start thinking, I can't go forward in my life without it. If I don't get this thing, then I'm just, I'm just stuck. And the other problem is that you might actually, at some point, get it. You might get that thing that you've always been wanting and then find out later on, you know what, this actually isn't everything that I thought it would be. In other words, you don't, you don't want us to let what you're waiting for become everything that you're counting on. That's a dangerous place to be. Okay, now back to Simeon. It says, now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. And that means he's a really good person. Okay, he's extremely devoted to God. He's extremely committed to his faith. And he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Now that's kind of an interesting phrase, and we'll, we'll come back to that one. But then in the next passage... Luke tells us about another woman, okay, another character, another person who also is hanging out at the temple. This is verses 36 and 37. It says, there was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. That's a long time to be alone. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them, okay, to Joseph and Mary, at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were, okay, essentially waiting. A group of people waiting. Okay, looking forward to, it says, what's called here, the redemption of Jerusalem. So Luke gives us two characters, a man and and a woman, kind of same scene. And one of the things that Luke does a lot in his gospel is he'll, he'll tell stories that pair up a man and a woman. And apparently part of what Luke wants is for people to know that the gospel really is good, and you think about their culture and the way women are valued. The gospel really is good for everybody. Okay, women as well as men. Okay, Gentiles as well as Jews. 27 times he has stories that pair up a man and a woman, and this is one of them, two characters, a very old man and a very old woman, and they're waiting, but they're not just waiting around passively. And it's critical that we understand, like waiting on the Lord has nothing to do with being passive or apathetic or slow to act when action is needed. Like if your boss comes to you and your boss says, you know, why don't you show more initiative and take more risks. And you say, well, I'm just waiting on the Lord. Okay, that would not be a good thing. And it wouldn't be a good reflection of somebody who's following Jesus. Just because we're waiting on God doesn't mean that we sit around doing nothing. In fact, we're told here that Anna was a prophet. Okay, a prophet's job was to confront injustice, to apply the scriptures to everyday situations, to challenge people to obedience in, to God, um, to get into people's faces sometimes. And, and, and Anna was well known in that culture for this very thing. And Luke wants us to know that, that she's a real person. And that's why he includes these little details about her. She shows up at the temple for her work every day. She's waiting, but she's working and moving while she waits. So Simeon and Anna, an old man and an old woman, and they're, they're at the temple waiting, and they're waiting for something big. It isn't just about their own personal circumstance. 
okay, a job or a relationship or a house. We're told that Simeon is waiting for the, the consolation of Israel. And for, uh, for Anna, we're told it's the redemption of Jerusalem. Now, those two phrases are kind of like prophet ease, like prophet talk. And the idea is that, that God is going to come and set things right. See, they're living in a context that was just stained with suffering. Evil people were in power. Injustice was rampant. The, the weak were, were suffering at the hands of the strong. They, they lived in a context where the love of God was, was almost completely absent, where, where the will of God was, was mostly defied, where hate flourished, a context where compassion was extremely rare, where the hurting and the poor had no hope, where the faithful were persecuted. So they were waiting on God to come, to act, to start something new. They were waiting for what, what they would call the kingdom of God, okay? for up there to come down here, for God to come and to begin to set things right in this world. So imagine Simeon, this, this old man, Every day, like day after day, he goes to the temple. God, is today the day? Not yet. The days turn into months and then into years. God, has, it, has the time come? Not yet. And everything is a mess and seemingly nothing is happening. And, then, and you have to picture this. One day, this old man, Simeon, goes to the temple. And on this day, a young couple comes to present their baby to the Lord. And Simeon reaches out and he takes the baby. And through the Holy Spirit, he understands somehow that this baby is the one. This is what he's been waiting for month after month, year after year. And now he's holding this child in his arms. And he looks at Joseph and Mary and he looks again at the baby. Okay, Luke chapter 2, 28 and 29. It says, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. Now, as Luke wrote in in his language, okay, in Greek, originally this was in Greek, the way that Greek grammar works, the statement actually begins with the word now. And this seems to be deliberate on Luke's part. Now you may dismiss your servant in peace. So the first word out of Simeon's mouth, after a lifetime of waiting, he's got baby Jesus, and he just says, now. And we think, well, wait a minute, why? Why? Why would he say now? Because nothing has really happened. There's just a baby. Nothing has changed. You know, Rome is still in charge, and justice is still rampant. Violence is still everywhere. The poor are still suffering. Israel is still a victim. Okay, widows still forgotten. Orphans still marginalized. What's different now? There's just this baby. Only that. There's just this, this little life. Only that. It's just that Jesus is, is here. And Jesus turns not yet into now. Not because Israel's circumstances are going to get a lot better right away. In fact, they're actually going to get a lot worse. But because Jesus is present in their painful circumstances with them. Simeon, this old man, day after day, year after year, you know, God, is it, where is it? And not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet. And then all of a sudden one day, now. And Luke is telling us something. And guys, this is just true. When Jesus comes into your life, when Jesus comes into your circumstances, okay, your pain, your suffering, your aloneness, your failure, your loss, your, your, your divorce, okay, your bankruptcy, your, your cancer, somehow this, uh, this crazy thing happens and yet, not yet becomes now. Not now everything is okay, But now God is here. Now I'm not alone. Now I have hope. Now I can go on. I mean, how glad is Simeon that he just kept waiting and kept waiting and he didn't give up. That he stayed faithful, that he trusted and waited. Because see, the danger for people that are waiting is getting tired. 
And then when I get tired of waiting, I, I, I stop being faithful to God. I stop obeying God. I stop trusting God. I decide I'm going to take matters into my own hands. Now, the classic example of somebody who got tired of waiting on God, somebody in the Bible who just got tired of waiting, that took matters into their own hands, is a couple named Abraham and Sarah. And originally they were named Abram and Sarai, and God would change their names later, and that's a story for another day. But God comes to Abram one day and says, I'm, I'm going to be with you. And I'm, I'm going to start this new people, Israel. And I'm going to do it through you. And you're going to have a son with your wife, Sarai. It will be the beginning of a new community and of, of redemption. Okay, consolation for the world. The redemption for the world. Okay, but Abraham is 75 years old at the time. And so naturally, he wants to know, cool. He's like, cool. Uh, when is this going to happen, God? Because I've been waiting for a child, if you didn't know, I've been waiting for a child like my whole adult life. And God says, well, not yet, just wait. Well, days turn into weeks, and weeks turn into months, and months turn into years, and eventually, more than a, more than a decade has gone by, and Abraham is now, he's in his mid-80s, and Sarah is in her, her mid-70s, and still no child, still nothing, just waiting, and waiting, and waiting, and waiting. And this is what the text says. Now think about the reality of that kind of waiting and, and, and the emotions associated with that kind of waiting. It says, now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go, sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. In other words, Sarai says, I've had it. Okay, I can't take it anymore. I'm not waiting around anymore. God's promise is broken. He's abandoned us. So, honey, we're on our own here. We better take matters into our own hands. So, go sleep with my servant, okay, my personal attendant, and we'll just, there's what we'll do, we'll just start our family through her. Okay, continuing in verse 2. Abram agreed to what she said. Well, honey, if that's what you really want, Okay. And he does. And Hagar gets pregnant. And then look what happens next. This is verses 4 and 5. It says, when she, okay, Hagar, when she, when she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. So this thing starts going kind of badly. And check out, check out Sarai's reaction. It says, then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. So there's kind of a reluctance, it seems to me, for Sarah to take any real responsibility in all of this. Abram, this is all your fault. Okay, look at what you did. May God judge you. And I have to imagine Abram going, yeah, but babe, you said... So Abram tries to fix everything. He says, well, okay, your slave is in your hands. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. And if you, if you know the story and if you know history, you know this thing spirals into an unbelievable mess. Like people who, who may not have read the Bible are amazed that this stuff is in there. And this is like reality show material, like the real housewives of Abraham. <laughs> and Sarai decides, you know, I'm tired of waiting on God. So I'm going to take matters into my own hands, or at least I'm going to put them into my husband's hands. And the fallout from that decision, okay, again, if you know history, is still felt around our world. You know, there, there's still wars being fought over this very thing. Tensions between Muslims and Jews it goes all the way back to this decision, this moment, a family divided, a hatred that developed. And it was birthed out of a desperate decision from a very frustrated woman saying, I know what God said, but he's not doing his part. So I'm going to do this my way. I'm going to do whatever I have to do to get what I want. And a husband unwilling to put his foot down or to put his wife's servant down, or 
whatever metaphor you want to use right there. It's this, I'm tired of waiting for God. I'm going to do this my way thinking. And this is, this is always the temptation. And it leads to all kinds of messiness. You know, I, I deserve to be loved. And I want intimacy. So, so I'm going to sleep with this person, okay? even though we aren't married. Even though I'm already married. Or he's already married. Or, you know, I, I want the promotion. See, I, I want the new position. I, I want recognition at work. I want a pay raise. I've, and I've been doing things the right way. I've been ethical, and it's, it's getting me nowhere. I see the way other people cut corners. I see the way other people do it, and, and I see them getting rewarded for it. So I'm just going to start doing whatever it takes for me to get ahead. Or, you know, this class is really hard. And I need to get a good grade. I have to have a good grade. And I've tried to study, and I've tried to work hard, and I've tried to ask questions, but it's not enough. And you know what? Everybody around me cheats. And they just get rewarded for it. I'm going to have to do whatever it takes to just get the grade. It's like, this is what happens. It's like people, it's, I'm tired of doing the right thing. I keep doing the right thing and I keep waiting for God to move and he's not moving, nothing's happening. God has, God's forgotten me. Okay, I, I'm on my own here. And man, can, can I just say something this morning? Like whoever you are and whatever it is you want and whatever you're waiting on, and, and I want to say this as tenderly as I possibly can, God has not forgotten you. God has not forgotten you. He sees, he knows, and he cares. And that leads to an important question that people often wonder. Okay, in any given situation, how do I know, like, am I just supposed to wait patiently here or should I take some kind of action? Like, I really want my old girlfriend or my old boyfriend back. Do I wait on them or do I write that relationship off and just start, start working my magic elsewhere? You know, or I don't like the job that I'm in right now. Should I actively pursue an, another job or, you know, would it be like more spiritual for me to just kind of hang out here and wait on the Lord? And here's what I would say you need to consider when you're wrestling with that kind of stuff. You look at your situation and then you just ask yourself a very simple question. Okay, given my circumstances, my situation, what would a person of good character, deep faith, and great wisdom do? And then you, you simply take your best shot at doing whatever that might be. In situations where it's not real clear what the right thing is to do or if you should be doing anything at all, then you just ask yourself, what would a person of good character, deep faith, and great wisdom do? And then, as best you can, you you take your best shot at it. Okay, so let's apply that to Abraham's situation. Would a person of good character, deep faith, and great wisdom have sex with their wife's personal assistant, even if their wife suggested it? I didn't mean for this to be a tricky question. Uh, the correct answer would be no. A person of good character, deep faith, and great wisdom would not have sex with their wife's personal assistant, even if their wife said, this is a good idea. This is very important. You know, like waiting on the Lord, okay, in other words, is not about automatically assuming that passive inaction is the more spiritual road to go down. Sometimes you need to do while you wait. Like both will be happening at the same time. You're waiting for God to move, but you're moving at the same time. You know? But what you do while you wait matters. Like it really, really matters. You want it to flow out of deep character, deep faith, and wisdom. And so I just want to say again, okay, if you're here this morning and you feel like alone in whatever it is, you feel abandoned, okay, 
I just want to say again, you're not. God sees. God knows, and God cares. He does. And God is working in ways that you don't see. He's working in ways that you don't know. And so you hang in there. You hang in there. I think about Simeon waiting day after day after day, year after year. And the whole time, God's message remained as he's asking, like, when's this? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. And then one day, it all changed. And Jesus was in his arms. And Simeon says, now. And it all came out of nowhere. And that baby would become a man that would fight for the poor. A man that would heal the sick and feed the hungry. A man that would give hope to the hopeless. That would give dignity to the most most marginalized. But that man would also be told by his father to wait. He would go into a garden. And he would cry out. Father, deliver me from this. And God told him, I will. But you have to wait. And so he waited. And through gritted teeth, he waited. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But he remained faithful. All the way to the end, he remained faithful. And after three days, God did the unimaginable. It turned out that God saw, God knew, God cared. And when the time was right, he acted. And that act is the hope of the world. And God has promised that one day he will act again. And on that day and thereafter, God says, get this, there will be no more suffering forever. That's the promise. And we cling to it. And in the meantime, we wait. But how we wait, it matters. God, I thank you so much for loving us. I thank you for being actively involved in our lives. I thank you that you are, you're on the move. I thank you that, that you're working stuff out in ways that we know nothing about, that we don't see, that we can't possibly know. But what we can know is that you love us, that you see, that you care, that you love us. And that you are leading us to good places. You're leading us to you. You're leading us to an eternity where there's no suffering, where there's joy that is unspeakable. And I pray this morning for those here who who are waiting and the waiting is hard and they're tired. God, I pray that you would help them to wait faithfully. To not take matters into their own hands and do something that they will regret. To wait faithfully. And I pray for us as well to have wisdom. And if you want us to be taking action while we wait, I pray that you would help us get our minds around what that is. How can we be doing while we wait in ways that honor you? God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for your son. Thank you for his birth and his life and his death and his resurrection and the hope that we have of one day being in a place where there is no suffering, which is unimaginable to me, really. Amen.